Um, like she said, I'm Jay Klamer, and I'm going to talk about elves today. I have to go kind of quick, so if you have any questions, please ask me after it's all done. Uh, so most of you in the front will have copies of my annotated bibliography. If you want one and don't have one, ask me after. I'm just going to start. This, uh, this project started looking at the images of elves in literature and fantasy entertainment. I started by looking at what we think of as an elf today, and then I moved backwards and found out where they came from. And I learned a lot of interesting things. Um, from my research, I found this question, what is an elf? So the first thing I did was I went to the Oxford English Dictionary. The name of a class of supernatural beings in early Teutonic beliefs supposed to possess formidable magical powers exercised variously for the benefit or injury of mankind. But this one, which I found even more interesting, which is even older, sometimes distinguished from a fairy as an inferior subject species. So they're fairies of a different species. As a more malignant being, like an imp or a demon. That's a, a little bit different than we think of elves today. So modern, modern entertainment in fantasy entertainment is full of elves. Uh, this is a, an image from the far right, from uh, a depiction of a half-elf in Dungeons and Dragons, where an elf is so similar to humans, we can breed. The, uh, the image here is from Lord of the Rings. I'm sure a lot of you have seen Lord of the Rings. That's what you think of when you think elf. And elves, in this case, they're humanoid warriors. They fight alongside us against the forces of evil. This image is from the very popular online game World of Warcraft in which elves are depicted as these natural, close to animals, close to nature, uh, users of magic, but also they're a species, like humans, very similar to these other cases. Uh, an elf depicted as a purely magical being is a concept that J.R.R. Tolkien championed in his novels. So a lot of the things you see in modern entertainment stem from his particular depiction of elves. Elves in his books were these beings, these humanoid beings that lived alongside us. They still are magical, but they're more like us than fairies are. If you look here, what I said, the modern elf and Tolkien's elf are one and the same. His influence on the shape of these fantasy characters is so strong that it can be seen in many other aspects of fantasy entertainment. Um, modern elves share some of their characteristics, but not all of them with these ancient elves, these more, more fairy-like elves. The shared traits, they have pointed ears. Every time they're depicted, they have pointed ears. It's a really important point. Because artists have used this very, get it, very small differences to show that they might look kind of like us, but they're something else. They're not us. Affinity for nature. They still always, in any depiction, have something about them where they're more connected to the natural world than humans are. It sets them apart from us, either through their behavior or through their lifestyle. Magical aspects. Every single depiction of metal, elf, has something magical about it. Either it's immortal, which is a very common uh, depiction of an elf, or they have spells they can cast, or they, they have some magical connection with animals. Uh, otherness. This is a really important topic. I'll go more into it on later slides, but it pretty much means they're not us. These new traits, these things that weren't there originally, they live in the material world. They're, they're here. They're not visiting. They live here. They have physical bodies. They're not, they're not like fairies. They're not ethereal. They have a corporeal form. They're good guys. Elves didn't start off as good guys. Elves and humans were in direct conflict. And they're warriors. Elves were not depicted as warriors. Not in the sense we have. They don't fight evil alongside us in older stories. Now the image of elves hasn't just changed. It's changed slowly over time. This is a depiction of elves from 1870, a painting called Triumphal March of the Elf King by uh, Richard Dickey Doyle. And it shows them the size of small birds and snails marching along with little fairy wings. And this is Lord of the Rings. I mean, this is about 130 years. They've changed from little fairy-like elves to this. But something interesting to note is that that is actually a huge departure from the original idea of elves. Elves originally, in stories going back as far as 300 AD, depict elves as being able to masquerade as humans. They looked enough like us. What is generally portrayed recognized as an elf today has its roots in much older forms of fantasy characters. Now, the, the cultures that I looked at were the Celtic, Norwegian, Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, and Scottish cultures, 
because they were the ones I had the best source info about. And all of these stories that regard elves also talk about the fairies. Early stories portray elves as tricksters, or powerful creatures to be feared and respected to prevent magical retribution. If you dug up the wrong tree, or if you killed the wrong animal, that elf's gonna get you. Oh, I have to go back. And I have a really interesting quote down here at the bottom. Uh, it is clear, however, that elves, goblins, and fairies were frequently thought of as highly malevolent. Okay. Um, some cultures depict elves and fairies as interchangeable terms depending on the action of the entity. So if you were talking about a fairy, it was not regarding humans. But if you're talking about the elf, is because it's a fairy punishing a human. Uh, Scottish elves would punish those who transgress against the natural world by inflicting a person or their livestock with an elf shot, which would cause illness or disease. Elf shots are common concepts related to elves within traditional myth and folklore. The etymology, or the word history, of the word elf uh, is very closely linked to the appearance of the term elf shot. They're, they're introduced around the same time. So the concept of elf and the elf shot were very important. An elf shot is the sickness you would get from the elf if you transgress. And it was considered the cause of major illnesses like epilepsy. Uh, it, it goes way back to explaining these things in the world. And that's a big reason why you see these archers. Almost every image you see of elves, they're archers. They're archers because from the very beginning, they've been shooting us. <laughs> uh, Scandinavian and Icelandic folklore uh, from around 300 AD and onward, depict elves as having their own world, this, this land of the Fey, is separate from our world. Uh, specifically, Norwegian folklore describes it as underground, subterranean. And this shows that, uh, that back a very long time ago, almost 2,000 years ago, um, the elves had their own place, separate from us that we can't even get to, that that's where they lived. And when they came here, they were visiting. Um, this is from later. This is from Chaucer's time. And he writes a ta the tale of the Surfopus and the Canterbury Tales about the Fey world. And what the story is, is Surfopus is a, a handsome knight. He can't find a woman that's his match, so he ventures out, goes to the fairy world to find an elven queen who will be his bride. And he can get there. So it shows <coughs> this kind of changing idea of what that fairy world, what the elf world is. It's still separate from ours, but you can get there. So why do we still use the word elves? They're really different. Why does this term, elf, persist within the uh, fantasy entertainment if it constantly changes its meaning? The changes we see in elven, in elven characters are very you know, mirrored by society change, societal changes. As more of the physical world was explained by science, the concept of magic began to lose popular, popularity. So what ends up happening is as we can explain more of the world around us, we know that there's no fairy world just over that hill where we've never been, because now we have a map that says there's no fairy world there. So the idea of this separate place that we can't get to doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So the idea that elves must live in a place we could get to makes more sense. Now I've got these, these, uh, these quotes here, which you can look at later if you ask. I don't have enough time now. But they're really good, I promise. <laughs> okay. the, the changes are striking, but what I find even more interesting is the similarities. The things that elves have uh, kept throughout all the years. Almost 2,000 years of these stories about elves, and some things are still exactly the same. One of the biggest things about elves that has not changed is that they continue to live in direct or indirect con contact with humans, often interacting with us in ways that are very different from how other humans will interact with us. What this means is they're, they're an influence that directly can affect our lives, but they're outside. They're something else doing it. An outside entity act, taking that action. And they also have maintained this idea that they exist on a line between our world, the material world, the purely physical world, and the magical or spiritual world. They exist in a liminal state in two places at once. This idea of the liminal is very intriguing to the human mind because we are designed to categorize and elves are hard to put in a box. They're not magical, and they're not physical. They're both, and that's what makes them so interesting. Elves have been a fantasy staple for thousands of years, and all indications are they're going to keep being a fantasy staple. We just like them too darn much. <laughs> but something that, that has been happening is that the, our depictions of elves are getting closer and closer to human. 
Uh, this picture is just a fantastic representation. This is a human. This is an elk. They're almost the same, but they're just a little different. And that's what makes them interesting. Thank you.